Israel has had her shares of kings. Many of her kings were wicked, cruel, and evil. And because of them, God has punished them. However, there is hope. In today's lesson, we will deal with uh, God promised a righteous branch. I'm going to tell you who that righteous branch is and how the scripture describe him. My brothers and sisters, there are notes for this lesson. I'll leave a link in the description below and in the comment section. Click the link, get your notes, your books, your Bibles for the Kojic Legacy edition of the Sunday School is now in session. Join me. Let's go. Teaching the Word of God in the spirit of excellence. Join Elder Rodney Jones with our Sunday School lesson. Building and equipping the children of God. Grab your Bibles and grab your notes. Get your lessons and get ready. Now let's go. The Bible, uh, the, uh, I started to say the Bible says a child saved is a soul saved, but actually it doesn't. The Sunday school says a child saved is a soul saved plus a life. Amen. Welcome to another edition of the Kojic Legacy edition of the Sunday school as taught by Pastor Rodney Jones. I'm the pastor of the New Nation Anointed Ministries Church of God in Christ. We're located 1700 West 87th Street in the city of Chicago, and our zip code is 60620. If this is your first time, please leave me a comment in the comment section below. I'd like to welcome you to Sunday School and to this particular channel. Thank you for viewing, and thank those of you who are new to this channel or who haven't take, who has already taken the time to subscribe to this channel. Do me a favor, please hit that like, that thumbs up, like, bell button, and click the subscribe and make sure you click that bell notification so YouTube will notify you. Bing! Brother Jones uploaded another lesson. I'm going to be brief with this lesson because as soon as I upload this lesson, I'm out of here. Exit stage left. I'm beginning the weekend of my 39th year wedding anniversary to my wife, Lady Lawanda Jones, which is we got married 20 or uh, 39 years ago. August the 20th, and then August the 21st is her 59th birthday. Yes, we're going to be celebrating her with a birthday dinner here at the church at 3.30. You're welcome to come by. You better hurry up because the space is limited. We are dealing with, what are we dealing with? Uh, let's see. We're dealing with a righteous branch. A righteous branch is what we're dealing with in today. And we're in uh, the book of the uh, Jeremiah, the 23rd chapter. Get, it, get yourself together, Jones. 23rd chapter, verses 1 through 6. And then we jump to Jeremiah 33, verses 14 through 18. Yes, verses 14 through 18. And if this is your birthday, happy birthday to you. If you're celebrating your anniversary, happy anniversary to you as well. As we prepare to get right into our lesson, a very good lesson here. God promised a righteous uh, branch. And I'm going to show you that this righteous branch is actually Jesus. Oh, to, you know, to just get straight down to it. It's actually uh, Jesus that we are dealing with. And uh, we're going to look at some things in here. Let's begin to read. As I fumble around with this computer of mine, I'm having all kind of issues. Let's look at what he said. Oh, my goodness, on today, very unique situation going on. That's me over in the corner. He says, Woe we'll be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. He gives a woe. Woe be unto the pastors. Now, there's one thing I need to let you know. 
that this word pastor is not what we think it is. And yes, y'all see me clicking this mouse. I'm multitask. I'm multitasking. Y'all said that the husbands can't do it. Eh. So number one, Jeremiah the prophet speaks doom and judgment to the leaders of Israel and to the leaders of Judah. These leaders were not performing the task that they were given by God to do. They were not doing their God-given assignment. They decided that they had something else that they wanted to do. Point number three is Israel had two main types of leaders. There were the spiritual leaders and there were the political leaders. The spiritual leaders would be the priests, the Levites, the prophets, the princes, and the heads of the family. The political leaders would be the kings and the judges, uh, and they may be both types, uh, but those are spiritual and political leaders. Here, he uses the word pastor, and I understand that many think that that word pastor is talking about the one that sits in the pulpit in our houses of worship. That's not who he was referring to in this printed text. <laughs> A verb, the word pastor, meaning to feed, to tend, to be a shepherd. It means in general to care for and to protect. Uh, one of the problems in this day that we're living in is what we call pastors, which yes, biblically there are pastors according to Ephesians, the fourth chapter. And I need you to understand for those who are always knocking the four walls, the purpose of the pastor is to shepherd and the pastor the people that come to worship God in the four walls. So if you get rid of the four walls, you get rid of uh, a gifting to the body of Christ because pastor is not an office. It is a gift. Yes. So there are three words that bear the same meaning in this chapter. The word pastor, the word shepherd, and the word feed. They all bear the same meaning. In other words, they grew up in the same apartment. They just may have had different rooms. Yeah, but they were in the same apartment and they may come from the same mama and daddy. They just got different rooms. Yes. So the pastors or leaders of the flock of Israel and Judah. They do not own the flock, but they have been called to care for the flock. That's another problem in this church that we're living in. Uh, the Bible says in Acts, I don't know, maybe Acts 20, 28. He says to feed the flock of God wherewith the Holy Ghost have made you overseers, which he have purchased with his own blood. So we as pastors or shepherds were given to feed God's flock. It's his flock. He owns it. The pastors and or shepherds were hired to do a work for the Lord. That's why he kept saying, my people, my sheep, my flock, my pasture. Uh, the pastors, they have been called to care for the flock. They must lead the flock through dangerous times and dangerous seasons. The pastor should handle the flock for who they are. They are the flock of God. And the pastors will give an account to the chief shepherd, which is Jesus Christ himself. And pastors are leaders placed over Israel or over Israel to feed them spiritually and physically. Now, this woe is to the pastors or the leaders that do two things. They destroy and they scatter the sheep. So which means it's not to everyone. He gives a word of woe, means, which means great sorrow or great judgment. It is a prophetic announcement of judgment. The sheep is in the pasture of the Lord. The Lord pronounces a woe to those pastors. These pastors apparently do not have the respect for the Lord. Uh, when you respect the Lord, you will respect what belongs to the Lord, and that's his people. They were feeding themselves instead of the flock, according to Ezekiel, the 34th chapter. They were eating the fat and clothing themselves with the wool off of the sheep's backs. Hmm. They killed them that was fed. They didn't feed the flock. They didn't strengthen the disease and they didn't bring those that were driven away. They didn't even seek that which was lost. No wonder he said war to them. The pastors or leaders, they have destroyed my sheep, he says. And the word destroyed is a verb meaning to perish, to loss, to wonder, or in the causative sense, it means to, to reduce to some dis, uh, degree of disorder, destroy. 
And these pastors or leaders, they have scattered, which means to dash in pieces or even to drive, to drive out. So if the leaders were not teaching truth, here's it. Watch this. If the leader does not teach truth, then the people would sin against God. When the people sin against God, God drove them out. That's how the leaders drove the people out by causing them to move against God and God drove them out. God punished the nation because the leaders caused them to sin. That's going to come up in the last phrase of this lesson. That's 1 Kings 16 and 19. Let's continue to move and see what else he's got to say. Crumble up and fall. There you go. He says, therefore, because of this, therefore, thus saith the Lord God of Israel against the pastors. Which one? That feed my people. You understand the one who caused them to scatter and the ones who destroyed them. He says, you have scattered my flock. Notice the my flock and driven them away and have not visited them. Behold, watch what he says. I will visit not just you, he says, but I will visit upon you. I will visit upon you the evil of your doings, saith the Lord. I'm going to visit upon you according to the uh, evil of your own doings, upon. So there's a threefold indictment from the Lord God of Israel. Number one, they have scattered God's flock. Number two, they drove them away from the pasture of his care. And number three, they did not visit the scattered sheep. God says he will visit their evil upon them, not just visit them. And then he seals and signs it and makes it authenticated by saying, thus saith the Lord. That's it. What else are you going to say? Because God is the one who said this. Since these pastors have scattered the sheep in his pasture or took the sheep from his pasture, since they have not visited nor cared for, but destroyed the sheep, the Lord now speaks judgment against them. He indicts those pastors that feed his sheep and lists his complaints against them. When you look at the word feed, it's a verb meaning to tend or to be a shepherd. The word feed means to care for or even to protect, to cover. And the purpose of a shepherd is to feed the flock which belongs to the, the owner. Hardly ever does the sheep belong to the shepherd. The shepherd in many cases was hired to watch, to care for, to feed and to pasture the sheep. The shepherd didn't own the sheep. God or the owner owned the sheep. So they scattered the flock. So a shepherd's job is to care for and feed the flock. The shepherd is to watch over for, protect the flock from danger. The shepherd is to make sure that, the, that they stay together by what's called a sheepdog. And back in my day, we used to call the deacon the sheepdog. He was to assist the pastor. The original assistant to the pastor was not another ordained elder. The original assistant to the pastor was his deacon. He was the assistant too. Now, there's a difference between assistant pastor and assistant to the pastor, but I'm going to keep on going. He says they drove them. They drove them away. The word driven means to banish, to drive away, to scatter, or even to forcefully remove. And what they were doing, they were being mistreated and they was causing the sheep to be scattered or they were not instructing them the ways of the Lord. And because of their sinning against God, God calls them. Uh, he drove them away as well. They didn't visit the flock, the sheep that are sick that were needed to be tended to, the sheep that fell into a hole, the sheep that was eaten by the wolf, the sheep that took sick by the roadside, the sheep that wandered off and got lost. The problem is the shepherd got too caught up or the pastor got too caught up in the 99 and he refused to stop, as Jesus says, to go get that one lost. No shepherd would ever want to lose one soul, not one Sheep. Oh my God, today. Come on in there. There you go. He says, not only that, not only am I going to visit your evil upon you. He says, I'm going to, I'm going to gather the remnant. Now God says he's going to personally gather. He is going to do the work. He would gather the remnant. The word remnant means that what's left of my flock 
Now, what, watch what he says. Out of all countries whither I have driven them. Now, notice he goes from they drove them to God driving them and will bring them again to their folds and they shall be fruitful and increase in the land. So since the pastors didn't do their job as pastor, the Lord himself will do it. Hmm. The sheep belong to the Lord and he will care for them himself. The Lord will first visit the judge and, and judge the pastors. And the Lord will gather what is left of his flock. He will gather his flock out of the country that he drove them into. He will bring them back to their own folds. And instead of being destroyed and scattered, they will be fruitful and increased. Notice he says, whither I have driven them. When the pastors caused Israel to sin, they were driven into other countries. God told them, if you move against me, if you do not hear to my commandment, if you do not hear, adhere to my laws, my statutes, he says, I will drive you out of your land and you will become the end of the servants or slaves to your enemies. However, God punished the enemies as well, but that's how God had to punish his people. The problem is it was leadership that caused them to sin against God and God drove them out, which is equivalent to the, the, the pastors or shepherds driving his people out. Mm -mm. P uh, uh, pastors that tell us that when we don't give God's people the word of God, and when they constantly do what they're doing because we have not fed them or given them the word of God, then we're causing them to sin. Oh, my God, on today. Let me keep on. What do y'all think about that? Let me let me let me t talk to me. What do y'all think about that statement that I just said? That if we do not give them the truth of the word and we give them any other thing, even Paul says, if I or an angel give you any other gospel other than what we have preached, he said, let them be a curse. A-C-U-R-S-E-D something. Hey, not a curse, but one word, a curse. And then a curse thing is a thing that was solely used for the purpose of the destruction of God. My God today, and I don't want that to take place in my life. So talk about that. What are, what are your thoughts about that? When preachers or pastors do not give the sheep the word of God from the scriptures, uh, how much responsibility is it on the pastor's side to make sure he feed the sheep the food that God gave him to feed them, which is the Bible? Talk to me right there. Pause the video and write your thoughts. How important is it? How important is it? Go on, fly away. Verses number four, he says, and I will set up shepherds over them. Now notice what God is setting up. He is removing slightly. Now remember, shepherd, sheep, or shepherd feed and pastor mean the same thing, but at times they stand alone on their own. He's removing these pastors and he's placing shepherds because I believe it is uh, on the, the, not the Jews, but the other nations, uh, they would set up pastors. Uh, but the Jews had what's called shepherds. Pastors are sometimes used as another phrase from another group of individuals. Let's say like the Babylonians would call their leaders pastors. Let's say the Egyptians would call their leaders pastors, but the Jews would call their leaders shepherds because there were people of shepherd mind uh sheep and so on and so forth therefore david said the lord is my shepherd he was a tiller or he tend to the sheep let's get back to this right here let me put that little small square that you can't see me he says i will set up shepherds over them which shall feed them and they shall fear no more nor be dismayed neither shall they be lacking saith the Lord. He always closes it out with Seth the Lord. So it's interesting to go from calling them pastors to shepherd, although they bear the same meaning, yet when you use it on its own, it gives it a slight different meaning. Number two, after the Lord deals with the pastors, he will gather the sheep back. The Lord will set up shepherds over his flock, and these would be shepherds. And the shepherds will feed them and the sheep will not have to fear 
in the longer. He says, I'm going to set up. The word set up means to establish, to confirm, or to rise, or to cause a rise. God says he's going to rise up some shepherds himself. He's not going to find them. He's literally going to plant the seed in the house of Israel and raise up shepherds himself. And these shepherds, and the word the word shepherd here means to pasture. It means to tend or to feed. And the word feed means to pasture. It means to graze as well. And I think, uh, uh, let me change the word right here while I'm here. I'm just saying, boom, boom, done. It's my notes. I can do it. Done. So man took the position to set himself over God's sheep and he messed them up. And God, as the true shepherd, will do his own work. But this time he's going to give them a shepherd who will not fail God. And because of this shepherd, the people will not fear the word fear, which means to be fearful or even to be dreadful. They're not going to be dismayed, which means to be shattered, to be broken, to be abolished or even to be afraid again. And they won't be lacking, which means to be missing. They're going to all be there. Somebody's not going to come and take them away. They're not going to wander off. They're not going to be lost because he is going to give them a shepherd that he has rose up himself. Let's push this train a little forward. He says, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I, he keeps saying, I will, I will, I will. I will raise, now watch who he's going to do this to. He's going to raise unto David a righteous branch and a king, which is the same thing. This righteous branch is going to be the king, shall reign and prosper and shall execute judgment and justice. Notice where he's going to do this in the earth. Sometimes the word earth means land and sometimes the word land means earth. So the Lord will first set up the shepherds to feed his flock for a time as phase one. Phase number two, the Lord will raise up from them, the house of David, a righteous branch. Now, Jesus is the Messiah who was also the prophet like unto David. That's Deuteronomy 18 and 18. Jesus, the righteous branch, is the priest after the order of Melchizedek. That is Psalms 110 and 4. And number five, Jesus is the chief shepherd, 1 Peter 5 and 4, because Jesus is this righteous branch. He was born king of the Jews. That's Matthew 2 and 2. He is the son of David, Luke 1 and 32, and he is our righteousness. That's 1 Corinthians 1 and 30. So the phrase, I will raise, is the same as in verses number four, where he says, I will set up. So the Lord promised to raise unto David two things from David, a righteous branch and a king who's going to reign. This righteous branch is the king who is going to reign. He will reign as king and he will prosper in his assignment. The word prosper is a verb meaning to act with insight. He will be prudent. It means to give insight, wisdom. He will use wisdom in everything that he does. He will execute both judgment and justice, not among the flock only, but upon the land. He is going to do this. Let's look at verses number six. In his days, the days of this righteous branch, in the days of Jesus, the days of the Messiah, In the days of the son of David, which is Jesus himself, the righteous king, in his days, Judah shall be saved and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name whereby he shall be called the Lord, our righteousness. Now, it's going to be interesting because we're going to see that word show up again in our next set of scriptures. Only it's going to be some type of something that's not going to look the same. So in the days of his righteousness, which is King Jesus, the Messiah, uh, Judah is going to be saved. Israel in his days is going to live safely. His name, or he's going to be called the Lord, our righteousness. And many times a person is given a name based on their character. So not only is he going to be called this because he's given this name, but he's going to be called this because this is his character as well. He will be the Lord and he will be the righteous and he will be our righteousness as well. 
He will be called the Lord, our righteousness, because that's what he does. Now we're going to jump down to Jeremiah 33 verses 14 through 18. And let's see what he says. Lay down and go to sleep. Behold, there's the word again. The days come, saith the Lord. Now he's still sealing it off with the Lord. This is the Lord. And sometimes that word, all capital L-O-R-D, means the self-existent one. He's the same one who met Moses at the burning bush, or I should say Moses met him at the burning bush. And when Moses says, who shall I say sent me? He says, you tell him I am that I am. The word am means to exist. He says, I am that I am. I exist because I exist. I'm the self-existent one. So sometimes the word Lord means uh, the existent one or self-existent one, the one in true living God. So behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will perform. That good thing which I have promised unto the house of Israel and to the house of Judah. So Jeremiah at this point was in prison when the Lord spoke to him a second time, Jeremiah 33 and 1. He said he will bring Judah and Israel back from captivity, Jeremiah 33 and 7. God said he would cleanse them and pardon them from their iniquity. Jeremiah 33 and 8. And he will cause the return of the captivity of the land and there will be joy again, which is verses 11. The Lord said that the days are coming that he will perform that good thing that he promised. And he made this promise unto the house of Israel and the house of Judah. He says, I will perform. The word perform means I will make to rise I will perform that good thing. The word thing means word, speech, or matter. I will perform that word. What word? The word that I promise. The word promise means to speak. It means a word or a matter, which is related to the word thing. So God says, I will cause to rise the word. That I spoke unto you. It's what he says. He's going to cause to rise, perform the good word thing he spoke, promise. And the good thing God promised, you can find that in Jeremiah 23 and 5. He promised also that he will rise unto David a righteous branch. That's Jeremiah 23 and 5. The righteous branch, which is Jesus, shall, be, shall reign and prosper over them. He will execute judgment and justice in the earth. And lastly, God promised to make a new covenant with Israel and with Judah. As Jeremiah 31 and 31, he says, not like the covenant that I made with your father, which they broke. This new covenant, my brothers and sisters, I need you to understand God uh, through his son, Jesus. He sealed that covenant. He certified it. He ratified it, ratified it in the upper room or that room where he had what's called the Last Supper and where he instituted the Lord's Supper when he says this cup is the new covenant in my blood. And when he got on the cross, that's when Jeremiah 31 and 31 throughout took place. And that, my brothers and sisters, included us in the deal. We got in on the new covenant and God says, I'm going to make what I promised you come to pass. Oh, my God. Thank you for the new covenant. Now, y'all can live in the old covenant all you want, but I'm in the new covenant. Hello, walls, as my grandmama would say. Mm. As I'm saying something, y'all know who I'm talking about. Verses number 15 says, in those days, we're still in those days. And at that time, in those days and at that time, will I. He's, he's, this is God talking again. He's going to cause the branch of righteousness to grow. He's going to cause the branch of righteousness to grow up unto David. He's going to come from David. He's going to grow up for the purpose of David. And he shall execute judgment and righteousness in the land. So in those days that will come, he is going to cause this to happen. God is going to raise up, which means cause uh, this to happen himself. This will not happen on its own. God is going to literally plant and cause this righteous branch to grow. He's going to shoot out from 
the stem of Jesse, shoot from the stem of David. He's going to be called the son of God, but he's going to be son of David and the seed of Abraham at the same time. So a branch is a shoot that stems out. And Jesus is the branch stemming from David. The word branch means sprout. It means shoot. It is the Messiah. He's the branch that's going to be shooting out. Point number two is God promised a rod out of the stem of Jesse, a branch. And this is Jesus. That's Isaiah 11 and 1. And point number three is he says the spirit of the Lord will rest upon him as a sevenfold spirit, Isaiah 11, 1 to 5. Number one, the spirit of the Lord. Number two, the spirit of wisdom. Number three, the spirit of understanding. Number four, the spirit of counsel. Number five, the spirit of might. Number six, the spirit of knowledge. And number seven, the spirit of the Lord. The sevenfold spirit is going to rest upon this righteous branch and he shall judge the poor with righteousness, so on and so forth. My brothers and sisters, that's verses number three. Point number four, God promised David a son to sit on the throne forever. According to Luke 1 and 32, God promised to give us Jesus the throne or give unto Jesus the throne of David, which he gave, he gave this promise through Gabriel, the agent or the, yeah, the agent or the messenger or the angel of God to marry his mother. And God promised David he would have a son established on the kingdom or with a kingdom. Second Samuel 7 and 16. He said he's going to execute, which means to make, to accomplish or to complete. Judgment. The word judgment sometimes means justice, and it is also a verdict because Judah had some 20 kings. Most of their kings were evil. They were cruel. They were wicked. There was no good, and they messed up the people. They were taking bribes and everything else, but this righteous branch is going to execute judgment and justice in the land. I hear him say, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to do these things. Verses number 16, in those days shall Judah be saved. Finally, Judah is going to be saved and Jerusalem shall dwell uh, safely. And this is the name wherewith, notice what he says. This is the name wherewith she shall be called the Lord, our righteousness. Now, remember, I told you to be careful of that phrase in the prior verses, the 23rd chapter, because it says he's going to be called the Lord, our righteousness here. Uh, now, this is a repeat of Jeremiah 23 and six. But here God is reiterating to to Jeremiah, who at this time is locked up. So regardless of what your condition is, when God makes a promise, the promise is going to take place. I need to speak to somebody, regardless of your circumstance, regardless of your situation. I just preached a message Sunday. I was inspired by one of the members of our church, uh, Evangelist Kimitrius Hunt. And the, my message was, the pit was not part of my dream. You saw the sun, you saw the moon, you saw the stars, you saw the mountain, but you didn't see the pit hole. You didn't see the pitfall. You didn't see the water and you didn't see the valley. But you've got to go through many of those things to get to the actual dream. So many of these kings uh, were messed up. But here he says, Jerusalem is going, uh, Judah is going to be saved and Jerusalem is going to dwell. And, and I said that because at this point, Jeremiah was locked up. But from time to time, God will reiterate his promise to the man of God and to others as a, an assurance, as a sign that you can continue. You can rest on my word. I'm talking to somebody. If that's you right down here, you're talking about me. You can rest on his word that his assignment will be fulfilled in your life. His ministry, his goal will be fulfilled in your life. And if you died, God will undie you. I know somebody spoke to me and told me that undie was not proper English. I'm going to need you to put your notes to the side and stop looking at that and look at what I said. And I understood what I said. God undied Lazarus. Lazarus was dead and God undead him. 
My God, today, we need God to undie our situation. So regardless of what it looks like, when God made a promise, his promise is going to be fulfilled. I hear the scripture say the zeal of the Lord is going to cause it to happen. I'm going to keep on moving. So this could I, I see. So we look at the word she. And I believe the word she is connected with the word Jerusalem. Jerusalem is going to be called the Lord, our righteousness, because Jerusalem is going to be representing Jesus himself. And Jesus is going to be there. And this is going to be his city. It's going to be his kingdom. And we are going and this is probably a picture of the church representing Christ. He as the head. And since he's the head of it, the body is going to line up. Come on, somebody. If you cut my arm off and give it to somebody, that's going to say that's the arm of Rodney. Leave my arm where it is. <laughs> Come on, somebody. So it appears that this, this <laughs> righteous branch is talking about Jerusalem. And therefore, he says she is going to be called the righteous branch. Or the righteousness or something like that. Let's close out with verses 17. For thus saith the Lord, David shall never want a man to sit upon the throne of the house of Israel. And lastly, neither shall the priests, the Levites, want a man before me to burn or offer burnt offerings and to kindle meat offerings and to do sacrifices continually. God has already promised that there's going to be somebody from the original setup that God made. It looks bleak right now. And at this moment, I forgot the last king. He has messed up some things. This kingdom has been removed. The priestlyhood is already gone. It's, it, you don't even hear about them uh, uh, in certain matters. So the Lord spoke to Jeremiah about two groups that will never cease. David will always have a descendant sitting on the throne. And the priests, the Levites, will always be able to burn offering before the Lord, offer up the grain and the sacrifices. So the term used is want a man. David will never want a man in both cases, in David and the Levites. He says David or, Le or the Levites will never lack a man to perform the tasks of the Lord. They will always have someone from their own to always represent them. God is still speaking to Jeremiah concerning the future of Jerusalem and her king. God said that David will never want a man. He will never have a desire to have someone. He will never lack a man. He will always have a man that was set on his throne. David was a man after the heart of God. That was 1 Samuel 13 and 14. And God promised David that he would always have a successor on the throne. God said, thy house and kingdom shall be established forever. 2 Samuel 7 and 16. David told Solomon that God promised this to him as well. 1 Kings 2, 4 through 5. But David told him, make sure you walk up before the Lord, you and your seed and everyone, so that this fulfillment can take place in our life. In other words, as long as we have a man that's going to walk up right before the Lord, the Lord will always give me a seed to reign on the throne. And the last group is the priests who are called the Levites here. They will always have a man to offer up proper sacrifices unto the Lord. Because the Lord chose the house of Levi to serve him. That's Deuteronomy 18 and 5. God chose them to minister before him or to minister unto him. Deuteronomy 21 and 5. And here he mentions a threefold task that they will always be doing. They will always burn offerings. They will kindle the meat offerings and they will do the sacrifices continually before the Lord. What a great lesson that we have here on today. God promised a righteous breast. Please allow me to encourage somebody as you go back to your classes to make sure that you instruct your classes that that righteous branch is Jesus Christ himself. And make sure that you encourage them to become a part of this future uh, uh, team, this future Jerusalem. 
Make sure that you invite them and encourage them to become part of the body of Christ, which we know as the church. Invite somebody to serve the Lord and to love the Lord from their heart. But make sure that we are living epistles and examples before them so that they want to serve the Lord that we are serving. And lastly, I will not have a live Sunday school this coming Sunday at 8 o'clock. I am celebrating this weekend. My wife, Little Wanda Jones, and I, Lady Lawanda Jones, and I, we are celebrating 39 years of wedding. 39. I met her October 3rd, 1980, at 8 15, 9 o'clock p.m. at 7 30 North Pulaski. I had on a white double breasted pip striped suit. Come on, somebody. Of course, I still remember that. We got engaged, and here it is. Uh, we're still engaged and we're still married. We got married at 19 and y'all told me I was too young to get married. Now I'm about to turn 59 in November. She's turning 59 this coming Sunday. I've already got my uh, uh, been gay from our 13. I got the nun Senate kind already in the hotel waiting for her. <laughs> Stop it. Don't y'all tell her. This coming Sunday at 3.30 at the church, we will be celebrating her in a dinner. If y'all want to come by, you're welcome to come by. I invite all of y'all. So I will not have my Sunday school. Those of you who would like to support this channel, there it is right there. And if you're giving something for Lady Jones, just comment in there, this is for Lady Jones. And I promise I will give it to her because I always give her a portion of what's given to me. She is a part of my ministry. I honor all of y'all. Shout out to my own bishop, Bishop Roland T. Sanders and his loving wife, Lady Shamika Sanders. Shout out to my presiding bishop, Bishop J. Drew Sheard, and the president of the International Sunday School, Dr. Mark Ellis, a very bright and smart president. I really honor that man, and I'm glad I'm a part of the Sunday School of the grand old and i praise god for you all listen i'm gonna give y'all some music yeah this is my jam session this is my sons and i we did this probably five or six seven eight years ago we just decided to go to my brother's studio and just lay down some track there was no rehearsal so if you hear any mistakes oh well but yeah i'm in there and these are some of my sons i have five sons and four daughters remember my motto teaching the word of god in the spirit of excellence and the model of the church of God in Christ, a child saved is a soul saved, plus a life. Amen. <laughs>